you guys. Uh, Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for these lovely women and um, for the way that they gave up their time and their energy to serve you and to tell people about you. So Jesus, would you just, um, Holy Spirit, speak to them today and uh, maybe be encouraged, motivated, and um, convicted by the words that they bring today. And um, would we be um, most of all encouraged to uh, go and do the same, whether in our neighborhood or around the world. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Kathleen. I'm a junior at Wayne State College, and I'm studying biology for pre-medicine, um, so I hope to be a physician someday. Yeah, and I'm Cheney. I'm also majoring in biology, but I'd like to be an occupational therapist someday, hopefully. <laughs> um, we're really excited to just share with you um, a little bit about our summer and what um, God has done in our lives and in the lives of uh, missionaries and people in Nicaragua. Um, this was at our like our little home base here. Um, we had a beautiful rainbow one morning, and so this is one of my favorite pictures from the trip. Um, yeah, just to give you a little bit of background, um, Nicaragua is one of the biggest countries in Central America as far as like size. Um, it's right between Honduras and Costa Rica. And so in Nicaragua, you can see the star, the capital of Managua. We are about an hour away, just south of there, in Messiah. <laughs> And yeah, some more background on their government. So they are a republic like America, but their system is very corrupt. So the president now, their family's actually been in power for like decades and he's only making um, like elected leaders family members. And like if you talk bad about the government, you could potentially be arrested. So it's just very um, corrupt and that's part of the reason that they are in so much poverty. Uh, their governments also ran in a socialist fashion, so um, that might sound nice that people think they have access to free health care, free education, things like that, um, but unfortunately, um, because the money isn't stewarded well, um, the health care and education is very poor, and that just uh, feeds into more cycles of poverty, unfortunately. Um, so when we think of the word poverty, I think most of us probably think of material poverty, um, maybe being homeless or just not knowing where your next meal is coming from. Um, but it actually is a lot deeper than that. Um, there are also um, other different areas of poverty. So this morning, um, we'd just like to challenge you to uh, maybe think about some areas in your life where you're experiencing some poverty, maybe spiritually, relationally, um, things of that nature. Um, yes, while we were down there, we talked about different ways of alleviating poverty. Um, the organization we went with, Students International, their focus is on development, which is on long-term venture to help people and communities to be good stewards of what they already have. And this is done by creating long-lasting relationships within the community. Um, some of the economic realities in Nicaragua, um, their unemployment rate is 7.4%. And all these numbers are like pre-COVID, so they're actually a lot worse now, unfortunately. Um, and their underemployment is about 50%. So these are people that are still working, but they're just not bringing enough home to like make ends meet. Um, as far as like converting um, their currency into American money, if you break down um, some of like the hourly wages, um, people who work in manufacturing, like in factories and things like that, are making about 71 cents per hour. Community services about 74%. And um, construction is one of the highest paying, like, average jobs that, um, like, an average person with no education could get. Um, they make about $1.18 an hour. 64%, um, no, 68% of Nicaraguans living in rural areas um, are trying to live off of just one U.S. dollar per day. And about 30% of the total population in Nicaragua lives on less than two American dollars a day. Yeah, and just for reference, like their currency is a Cordoba, which is about 35 Cordobas to one US dollar. So like for Americans, stuff is pretty cheap down there. And they do have um, like minimum wage there, but because there are like our informal economies there, most people do make less than like the legal minimum wage. Um, yeah, so kind of just put all of that um, <laughs> knowledge that we threw at you into um, an applicable, um, kind of picture. Um, this is a meal called gallo pinto, which translates in Spanish to speckled rooster because the rice and the beans look like a little speckled rooster. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so this is like a very average meal that um, a Nicaraguan family would eat almost every night of the week. 
Um, so it's just like leftover rice and beans from a previous meal, throw in a tortilla um, to make it more filling, some sour cream. Uh, maybe once a week you might uh, be able to go to the market and bring home some meat to add some protein to it. Um, it's a very filling meal. We ate it a lot down there and we loved it. It's actually <laughs> very delicious. Um, so it's very filling, but like, as you can tell, like eating this every day, like you get deficiencies. There um, are areas of a proper diet that are missing. Um, but to make this, it costs about 30 cents per person in your family. So very affordable. Um, yes, here's the healthcare, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, one of those is my brother, Leif. Um, but they're making soup for a bunch of families. Um, one of the things for healthcare, they not only just set up like clinics, but they also worked on teaching nutrition um, since so many people are, um, have very poor diets there. So here they just made a big pot of soup for families to come and take to home to their families. So this is very much a part of like the community development side of missions. Um, they're not just providing meals, but they're like educating uh, mothers on like ways to affordably um, get ingredients and like make these meals that they could eat a couple nights a week. Um, so here's some more pictures of them preparing it. And then these are some of the fam this is like the family that's blessed um, by this service. Um, I think there's about like 15 families I think um, that use this um, site in the um, in the missionaries down there. So the children like come with little buckets um, and they fill up their soup and then they take it home and that's, um, it just helps them like have some nutrition for the week. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the landfill. Um, there was an education site in this community called El Faro and this is actually right next to the road that we were on our way to get there. Um, this community is just pretty much lives right next to this um, landfill and people live and work here and like get a lot of their materials to build their houses from here. As you can see, the sheet metal, they're very resourceful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just like driving through the landfill, like you'll see people like picking things to like, that they can use. Um, so. This is called <laughs> La Pila. This is their washing machines um, for like your clothes. Um, so on the right side there is like a little basin of water to rinse your clothes. And then on the left side is a like, corrugated concrete where they're scrubbing. So these are some of the realities in Nicaragua. Oh yes, and we also found out you can't drink the tap water because you risk getting a parasite. Um, so they actually came up with this little device. Um, that top brown part is like clay, and so they'll pour the water through that, and then all the impurities will get stuck in the clay. That way you can have clean drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have any hot water when we were showering. Um, you can't flush toilet paper down there, surprisingly enough, because <laughs> their plumbing systems just aren't up to like our infrastructural standards in America. Um. Yeah, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about like the setup of the organization we went with, which is Students International or SI. So Students International um, is pointed towards um, college students, but anybody of any age can go. So if you're interested, you can go on missions with Students <laughs> International. Um, and they really kind of um, put you in a spot that you're using your talents and your interests um, to serve people and to serve God. So there are different types of sites. Um, like, first one is agriculture site. This is Olman. He is um, a native Nicaraguan. He's the leader of the agriculture site. Um, in this picture, he's um, water witching. Does anybody know what water witching is? Heard of that? Okay. <laughs> um, so they look for water when digging a well, like for the farmers that they're serving. Um, this like helps them find the water underground. Um, so he's also working every day um, with local farmers and ranchers, um, doing devotionals with them, speaking the word of God into their lives every day, and discipling them. Some pictures of the fruits that they cultivate. This is a field that they. Um, Ullman and his team um, cleared to turn into um, farmland for crops. Uh, next one is the education site. So um, the girl, yeah, in the back there with the face mask, she he is Eleanor and she's the leader. Um, it's pretty much just like an after school program for kids just to get a little bit more help. Um, and it's kids like K through six, I believe. And they're learning more about school and also learning more about Jesus in the meantime. And coincidentally, Olman and Eleanor are married, um, and so they were just a huge encouragement to us, and they really um, are role models to us um, as to what it looks like to serve God in marriage, but also um, just individually, um, and to do that with a, a servant's heart. 
Uh, there's the physical therapy and healthcare site. Um, we have more pictures on this later because this is where Cheney and I were serving. Yeah, and as far as the microfinance site, um, our members of our team would work alongside women in the community to help them make products that they can sell and make a living for themselves. Um, they also did like microloans and a lot of terminology I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, so this is a picture of like a woman who makes tortillas um, and she sells them and that's how she makes a living for her family. Um, unfortunately, in Nicaragua, there is a large culture or around um, marriage isn't super important to them. So a lot of um, couples just decide like they'll stay together and they'll start their family, but marriage is never really in the picture. And um, a lot of men do leave their families after a while, and so a lot of women are left to raise their families on their own. Um, and so that makes it really hard to um, make ends meet when you're a single mom um, with a um, a tough economy to live in in the first place. Um, so a lot of these women are forced to, um, or they resort to prostitution to provide for their families. And so some of the women who have been blessed by this site um, have that history and um, now they're successful businesswomen and they are entrepreneurs and they own a business and they are selling products that they make um, and they're using the talents that God gave them to make those products and um, yeah, to also just learn more about him. A lot of women have um, came to Christ um, through um, meeting the people here at the microfinance site. So God is doing huge things in this site and it's one of my, my favorites that um, SI does. Um, yes, the sports site is also kind of like an after school club. It's a boys club, um, pretty much just kind of keeping guys off the streets and getting out of trouble. Um, they do all sorts of stuff. Soccer, baseball is really popular down there and they just do devotionals with them as well. Uh, the construction site is really cool. Um, it's for, they serve young men who maybe have dropped out of school or have not decided to continue their education after high school. Um, and so they're teaching them hands-on skills that they can use um, to later become repairmen or um, just work for a construction company. Um, and so they can, even though they've dropped out of school, they can make one of the highest paying salaries um, in Nicaragua for an average person. Um, so, yeah. Um, and women's social work is pretty similar to microfinance. Um, it actually wasn't going when we were down there, but normally um, they're working with women in the community to maybe teaching them like cosmetology or cooking um, just so they can support themselves and their family. And yeah, there's just an example of them. <laughs> okay, so now we told you a little bit about our organization that we went with. Um, we just wanna tell you and share about our time in Nicaragua personally. Uh, this is our team that we went with. Um, so there's four of us from Wayne here. We all uh, went to college together. Yeah, so a typical day, we would wake up, wake up at about like 6.30, 6.45 and do a devotional with the whole team, then eat breakfast, and then load up in these vans to go to our different ministry sites, and we'd be there from about 9 to 4 every day. So on your way to your ministry site, whether that be construction or healthcare or education, wherever you might be serving, you can see all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> um, so Nicaragua doesn't really have any like OSHA standards or safety standards in the roads, so you see all kinds of crazy things on your way to, on your, way to your site. Um, on the right here is a guy holding a little baby on a motorcycle. It's really not uncommon to see um, like a mom and a father um, on a motorcycle because that's so, that it's cheaper for gas and gas is really expensive there for them. Um, so motorcycles are a more affordable way to get around, um, so a lot of times you'll see just small children like sandwiched between the dad and the mom on the motorcycle. No helmets, um, this is how it is. Um, on the left side, there's a motorcycle that has a pushing lawnmower strapped onto it. <laughs> um, so this guy that had this um, was a gardener. That's how he makes a living, and so that's how he gets around to work and carries his supplies with him. Yeah, and as you can see, he's doing just like a cattle drive in here. Um, he's a real cowboy. <laughs> um, there is also just a bunch of like stray dogs and chickens just kind of running all over the place in the towns. And you can tell those are not Nebraskan cows. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's just another example of things you might see in Nicaragua. Um, we saw this guy a couple mornings. Um, we don't know who he was or what his story was, but um, just while I was down there, it was really, really touching to see just like, People that I don't know their story, but they had to hold just as much value and carry just as much value in, in God's eyes um, as you and I do. And so, um, yeah, my heart just really went out for these people, um, even though I might not have ever met them. 
Um, this is kind of another example of something you might see. This guy um, doesn't have like a cane or a walker, and so um, due to like the socialist um, society down there, um, they don't really have access. Their healthcare <laughs> doesn't really isn't great. So um, like we're here, you might have access to like Medicare. Um, you have those resources to get like a cane or a walker or something, but unfortunately, it's just not the case down there, and so um, you have to make the best of what you have. Yes, so here's the clinic that Kathleen and I served at. They actually just opened this, and it actually used to be a house, but the PT um, transformed it into a clinic. This is the physical therapist that we were working with. His name's Paul. Um, he's originally from California, but now um, he does missions full-time with his wife and two children. And yeah, this is just like the inside of the clinic that we can get to. And then Paul actually let us do some hands-on stuff, which was really fun. Um, so in this picture, I'm just using like one of those therapy gun things to give one of the, the patients a massage. <laughs> And I know we're not supposed to have favorite patients, but this one definitely <laughs> was. Um, her name was Elda, and we helped her with her shoulders a lot. Um, and she told me I need to practice my Spanish a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> but she had suffered from two falls um, and like uh, severely injured both of her shoulders. And there's just not a great um, culture or like um, program or education about like rehabilitation after injuries like there is in America, so um, I'm sure many of you maybe have like had physical therapy yourself or something, um, but that's just not really the case down there. So um, yeah, rebuilding your shoulders um, really has brought like a, brought back a lot of like range of motion and improved her quality of life. Uh, this is Sal. Um, Sal was born with a condition called hydrocephaly, um, which is just like excess fluid um, surrounding the brain, and so he uh, he had surgery, like a radical surgery, as a little baby, and it saved his life. Um, but unfortunately, he um, was left with physical impairments that um, affect his balance and just like muscular strength. So we worked a lot with him um, with balance exercises and just strengthening his muscles to improve his quality of life as well. Yes, yeah, so this is um, the girl on second to the last there. Um, her name is Anna. She was one of our patients. Um, she, we saw her <clears throat> probably like the first day. Mm -hmm. Um, she has like one of the worst spines, worst cases of scoliosis. It's a miracle that she's even walking around. Um, and she had previously lost her son back in 2019, I believe. Um, and so she was just really struggling. Um, but she opened up our hearts to us and invited us into her home and we got to meet her whole family. Um, right next to me is Aaron, her son, who wants to be a PT and he's actually volunteering at the clinic now, and Paul's mentoring him, and then the girl on the end, her name is Diana. And then this is Anna's granddaughter, Selena, who absolutely stole our hearts. Um, she's three years old and a little sassy. <laughs> 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 and then, yeah, one of the days we actually drove to a local park and did water therapy which with a bunch of disabled kids and their parents, um, which is just a really fun way to mix up doing therapy. Yeah, give them opportunity that they might not normally have um, getting to go to a pool, um, but it's not like a common commodity, but um, so yeah, these kids got to um, experience hydrotherapy, which was um, great for their bodies and it was a different way to like move and experience the world. Um, getting there was a challenge though, however, um, this is something you've probably never seen in America, but um, so this little boy is constrained to a wheelchair, and so really the only way that we could get him to the pool um, was just to load up everybody in the back of a pickup, and so that's how we got there. And one of the days, um, they took us on a little expedition, and we got to go to this beautiful laguna, uh, or lake, and uh, Kathleen and I and my brother Leif all got baptized out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really incredible to me just to like know that like places like this are in Nicaragua, but then two miles down the road you see places like El Faro where that landfill is. Um, so it's really striking to see like the difference. Um, but I also think it's super um, evident that that also exists in America. Um, we do have like pockets of poverty and we also have, like I said, like uh, relational and spiritual poverty um, in our lives as well. 
Um, so yeah, as far as like after like ministry and um, just relational things that we experienced there, some of our um, laughs that we had um, were like seeing signs like this that said, caution, watch for falling mangoes because there are mango trees everywhere and you could get hit in the head by a falling mango if you're not careful. <laughs> um, they also took us to an active volcano which was, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> very smoky. Yeah, very smoky. <laughs> and we saw lots of creepy crawlers down there, um, <laughs> lots of geckos and iguanas, um, and this scorpion, which was um, under my bed, and Chaney so heroically um, smashed it with her shoe <laughs> um, because I was petrified and I couldn't move. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is just on the way back home. Um, we left Nick Rock with very heavy hearts, um, but we met so many people. Um, our hearts were full, and that's why they were so heavy. Um, but we do just still um, think and pray about um, everybody that we met down there every day. <coughs> and um, <laughs> last, last thing we did before we, or first thing we did when we got home was eat pizza. <laughs> um, we were very hungry. Yes, and then we're just going to end with some scripture. I'm just going to read this really quick. Um, if among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your town within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because of, for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother to the needy and to the poor in your land. And I think the biggest takeaways personally for me was it's easy to be like, oh, I'll be more generous and I have more money to do that. Um, but these people practically have nothing and were the most generous people I've ever met in my life. Um, the community that we served in, their churches actually do mission trips for the east side of the country, which is even like worse off than they are. So I just thought that was amazing. And it's really easy to come back home being like, wow, we're so blessed and don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, which we are blessed, but with that blessing comes a great responsibility to serve our brothers and sisters. Oh, another passage of scripture I'd like to share with you this morning is 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. <clears throat> As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who is richly provides us with everything to enjoy, there to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of what which is truly life. And so I think um, it's really easy to look at like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and say, oh, those are the billionaires of the world, those are the people that should be uh, giving to the poor and um, um, yeah, helping um, those that have less than them. Um, that's a really easy thing to think, but um, the Bible really is referring to, when we talk about like the rich people in the Bible, like it's, it's you and I. Like, uh, it says the average uh, middle class Americans, um, we really are greatly, greatly blessed, and um, it's our responsibility, and God commands us um, to be good stewards of what we have and to, um, yeah, serve him in that way. Yeah, so that's pretty much it, but if you guys have any more questions after, we'd love to share about it. One more takeaway. <laughs> That's probably my like, main takeaway from the entire trip, um, is that um, although um, the Nicaraguans do have so little and they um, live in a lot of material poverty, um, it's through that, um, those shortcomings that they, they just don't have enough to make ends meet, that they're able to like, recognize their need for a living hope. And so that was one of the most um, impactful things that I experienced there, is just like the openness towards the gospel in Nicaragua, um, yeah, just because um, they don't find their identity and their hope in material things, they realize that um, uh, they do need a savior and their hope is in God. So I hope that encouraged you this morning. <laughs> My name is Hannah, I'm also a student at Wayne, I'm also a junior, and I'm studying graphic design. Sorry I didn't have a better um, transition than that. Um, <laughs> but I went overseas this summer, and I was gone for eight weeks, and I went to three countries with an organization called Royal Servants. Um, I'm repping their t-shirt right now. Uh, yeah. Um, but, jeez, okay, got to figure out how to do this. So, um, 
Royal Servants serves um, the community by taking teenagers on longer short-term missions, uh, where many people go for one or two weeks to overseas. These trips are four to eight weeks. Um, like I said, I went on the eight weeks one, but they just, they take students from all over the United States and sometimes even from Canada, and we meet up at a spot called Training Camp um, in Partyville, Wisconsin. It's not that exciting for a name called Partyville. <laughs> As you can see, we live in um, a row of tents, like lots of tents, and this is what we call the Big Top. And we get together and we worship under the Big Top a lot, and it's just really amazing to see all these people from all over the United States and all over um, sometimes Canada, and they just love Jesus so much that they're coming and they're going to learn how to serve overseas. And when you show up at training camp, most of the time you have no idea the people that you're going overseas with. Um, I've gone on a trip with Royal Servants three times. My first year I went to Uganda. Um, the second year I went on a trip called the Nehemiah Team. And the Nehemiah Team is a, it's a team of alumni, so people who have gone on trips previously, and they get invited back on this Nehemiah Team. And the Nehemiah Team learns more about leadership and how to be a better leader, and it's just like cultivating leadership in young students who have a heart for missions and have a heart for the gospel and things like that. And this year, I actually went on the Nehemiah team again, but I went as a senior staff, which is actually um, an assistant to the trip leader, which was a crazy experience, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but just training camp in general, the Nehemiah team, um, we teach them dances and other skill groups. Sometimes we teach them puppets. Sometimes we teach them dramas. We're just learning. Um, all of the, the Nehemiah team helps teach the other trips that are going how to serve and how to preach the gospel. So we go to a number of different places. Uh, Royal, Serv Sorry. Royal Servants sends people to Costa Rica. They send people, this year we went to Alaska because of COVID. Uh, they have trips to Kenya, um, all different places in the world, and every ministry looks different. Sometimes you can straight up be like, Jesus loves you, and sometimes you're in a country and you can't even say the name of Jesus with, like, openly in public. Um, you need to be very careful about it. And so skill groups is something that we use to preach the gospel and to draw a crowd. So oftentimes dance is used as a way to just, you stand up in the street and you start shaking a move, and then people are like... Those Americans look weird. <laughs> they really do. And so they come in, and, and then you get to go, and sometimes you'll start a drama if you're able to in that country. Or sometimes after your dance, you just go out and you start to talk to people, and you say, hi, like, I'm Hannah. I'm from the United States, and I'm here to talk to you. Like, and that's a way that you can use to share the gospel. So training camp is just preparing these students to go overseas. So I spent three weeks at training camp. It was a lovely time living in a tent for three weeks. Absolutely enjoyed it. Um, but I was preparing, I was learning how to be a leader um, for my team. I had to help pack food for us to go overseas because some teams, especially like the Kenya team, we can't eat what's over there because it's just not safe. And so we pack up ramen, we pack up oatmeal, we pack up um, peanut butter and jelly, and I will not eat oatmeal in the United States because of royal service. <laughs> Um, so like I said, I was a trip leader um, this year. This was our main trip leader. His name is Tom. He's really awesome. Um, he's got a goofy grin and I love it. Um, and then that's me. Ah, right there. Um, so I was a trip leader and my main purpose on this trip was to help Tom and to help the other trip leaders and to do social media for our team which is not something that you typically would see, but I was there to inform parents that their children were still alive and that they were doing great. <laughs> uh, we also have a medical person to take care of any issues that we have overseas. We have a finance person who helps exchange money and all those things, and then we have a food person, and I actually helped the food person as well. This is Kenny, she was our food person. So, especially in Turkey, I would go to the grocery store with her, we would try to use Google Translate to figure out if we were buying butter or cream cheese, and we would try to figure out how to feed our small team on our budget that we had. So the first location we went was Istanbul, Turkey. Um, Turkey is a very Muslim country, and it is not exactly receptive of Christians. We were originally planning to go to Israel, and a week before we were supposed to leave, 
we found out that Israel was not opening up to tourists and we could not go. That was not enough time to find a ministry partner in Istanbul. While Tom has been everywhere, it seems like in the world, he had never been to Turkey. <laughs> so it was the first time for all of us and we had no one to help us when we got there. But we still found a way to serve. Um, we did a lot of conversational ministry, as you can see up here. These are two of our girls sharing with some people that they met. Um, we stayed in a place close to the Grand Bazaar, which is just a huge marketplace where a lot of tourists go. And the nice thing about tourists is usually they speak English and people who work with tourists speak English because tourists speak English. So although there was um, challenges of language barriers, we found a way around it and we didn't have a ministry partner, but we just went and we did what we could. So our team was sent out almost every day to the Grand Bazaar. We're actually in the Grand Bazaar here. It's just, it's a marketplace, like I said. And I've done a ministry like this, and it is difficult to walk up to somebody every day, especially someone who's so set in their religion, um, as many Muslims are, and honestly, like, if someone came up and tried to share their gospel to me, I'd probably be a little unreceptive as well. But it's just very hard to walk up to this person and be rejected time after time. And so conversational ministry can be extremely difficult, and I feel for my students. And I'm glad that I was able to be there having that experience before so that when they struggled, like, I could a little bit speak to them and be like, hey, like, I understand. It's really hard. Um, but God was working in Turkey, and I think that Israel not opening up for us and us being forced to go to Turkey was not an accident. Um, we also, while in Turkey, got to experience some of some religious sites. Um, we went to three of the Revelation churches, which was really cool to experience. We got to learn more about um, the history of Christianity and what Christians in living in Bible times got to experience, and we got to see those places, and that was really cool for us as well. A little more of a heartwarming um, ministry that we did was in Moldova, which was our second location. We were in a village called Bravicha, um, and we did a kids camp. We actually did two of them. They were five days long, and we did one at the church that we were staying in, and then we did one in a gypsy village, which um, gypsies don't have a good rep. It's kind of a bad term to use, actually, um, but they are known for taking things. They're known for being like messy people. They're known for like not having their life together. And so just working with these kids who have been labeled as gypsies and who were like outcasts in their own community, it was really just heartwarming to see, especially since the kids in the gypsy village were actually way better behaved than the ones in like the normal village. Um, but this is our team with the Moldovan leaders. We went and we served and originally we thought we were going to be leading this camp and then we got there and there was Moldovans to lead and they had a program set and we did not know anything that was going on and we had two translators and there was over 80 kids and we didn't know what was going on because we didn't speak the language. Um, but we made it work. This was one of our translators, her name is Catalina. She was amazing um, and just even in getting to know Catalina, she has such a heart for the Lord. Um, she's 22. She goes to college in the capital of Moldova. And she came um, and spent the week with our team just so that she could help us reach these children. And she, she actually was going to start her own camp um, a couple weeks after we left. But she received so much um, I don't want to say hatred, but there's a lot of people that don't believe that she should be doing what she's doing because she is a strong woman, she is not married, and she's trying to preach the gospel, and that doesn't really go over well in a place like Moldova, but she has such a heart for the Lord, and just getting to meet with her and having her teach us about the culture of Moldova and watching her learn some of our um, American tendencies was kind of funny, but... We also did something called, um, like we just did some outreach in the village. Um, the pastor that we were staying with, he regularly visits these people. They're either confined to their home because of sickness, they can't provide for themselves. This house specifically, um, the woman had been abused by her husband and her sons, and now she sees none of them and she doesn't leave her house. And so he takes her food and honey and things to help her survive. 
and we just went and visited with her and prayed with her and talked with her and all these things. Um, but just in that, like, the people in this church that we stayed at, their congregation is maybe 30 people, and they serve more families than that that are in the church. Like, these people are feeding families outside of their church greater in number than the people that go to the church. And so just seeing that even kind of like what Kathleen and Cheney said, people love the Lord so much that they're willing to give in abundance when they don't even have that much for themselves. So Moldova was just a really good way to um, kind of lift the spirits of the students. We were gone for so long that after Turkey, you got a little, you didn't necessarily have those stories of like someone just clicked and they were like, I love Jesus now because you were talking to a lot of um, Muslims and so it was hard ministry. It was very much trying to just dig a hole to plant the seed. And so Moldova was a great way to like relift their spirits and to say like, you know, you are doing something worthwhile and it is helpful and it, it was just a more visible way for them to see the work that they were doing. Um, the last location we went to was Odessa, Ukraine and this was for our debriefing. Um, debriefing is something that Royal Servants strongly believes in because we spent 53 days together and um, a majority of them were out of the country experiencing things that you've never experienced before. Even the change from Turkey, which is more developed to Moldova, like you got a little bit of culture shock just going from that. But then just to go back in the United States and to return to daily life, it was so difficult for these students that um, they work hard to keep us alive. So um, debriefing focuses a lot on reflection and just kind of what just happened to me. Um, and then we also spent some time just, you know, having some fun. We went to a children's ballet in Ukraine. That was pretty fun. And, you know, that's us eating some pizza. But it's just, um, it's an opportunity to reflect on the summer before getting thrown back into what everyday life looks like. And <laughs> we were also, once again, supposed to go to Israel. Um, we tried so hard this year to get to Israel. And we were going to try to go, even though we were able to not go on the first half when we were supposed to go to Turkey, we were going to try to get back there for debriefing. And um, it was one of our first nights in Moldova. So we were about three weeks out from going to Israel. And we were told again they weren't going to open up. And so we were kind of just, as the leadership team, we had some knowledge that the students didn't of that we were no longer allowed. And we were just like, OK, so what do we do? We're stuck here in Moldova. We got to get back to the United States eventually. We could go back to Turkey or I don't know, maybe catch a bus to somewhere. And we ended up deciding to catch a bus to somewhere. We, um, <laughs> two days before we were supposed to leave Moldova, we decided we were gonna go to Ukraine. And about eight minutes before we had to cancel our reservation to get our money back, we made a new reservation in Odessa, Ukraine. And that seems just silly, but it's just, God was always one step ahead of us, thank the Lord. <laughs> because we were way behind. Um, I, a lot of times, want to say, like, God, can you just, like, give me a little bit of insight? Like, what does my future look like? But then I remember that he took me to Odessa, Ukraine in two days, and so uh, <laughs> trust in the Lord, everybody. Um, this summer was actually really difficult for me, not in my physical well-being or anything like that, but in a lot of, like, my emotional and my self-confidence. I was not prepared to be asked to go on this trip. Um, I wasn't even sure I was going to go on this trip until one Sunday. <laughs> we were singing a song and it hit me in my feels. Um, asked Deborah about that. But <laughs> um, so I signed up to go on this trip in March. And um, like I said, it started in June. And when I originally signed up, I wanted to be a staff discipler who is someone who goes and they work with a small group of students and they're usually college aged, which I am, and they just like work in the daily life with these students. And I was really excited for that because I was like, you know, I've been through this a time or two, like I can kind of help them out. And I was excited for that. And then Tom called me up and he was like, hey, your trip to Ireland and Scotland is being canceled because of COVID. I was like, sweet. I was also, when I got this email, I had just been, you know, studying for like finals, 
And uh, it was a pretty late night, and I just started crying, and I was like, I don't know what's going on. But he was like, hey, if you'd like to, you can come like lead a trip with me. And I was like, you're crazy. You really are. Um, I've been on two trips previously, but I was like, I'm not qualified. I was 19 when I signed up, and I was like, these students, I had a student that was older than me. I was like, I am not supposed to be here. Um, but I heard this thing once that said, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And um, like I said, I did not feel prepared for this, but God used me in my weaknesses and um, I struggled a lot with the fact that I wasn't necessarily going out every day and I wasn't necessarily talking to the people of, in Turkey. I was shopping for food, I was taking pictures to post on social media for parents. I was getting sent away in a taxi with a bunch of Ukrainian money to go find bus tickets to get back to Moldova, which was honestly one of my favorite parts of the trip. Um, just when my trip leader trusted me enough to be like, hey, so we have to get back, otherwise we don't go home. Here's some money, go do it. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> um, so I didn't necessarily go and speak to people of Turkey. Um, when we did our missions in Moldova, I wasn't always there with the kids every day, teaching and talking to them. I was running around trying to find craft supplies. I was trying to make sure that the switch from sports time to craft went well, and I was trying to find the snacks to see if they were cut up already. But in that, my team was able to accomplish a lot of things. My team was able to share the gospel, and I was able to minister to them when they were struggling, and I was able to pray for them when they were struggling. And this is not what I was expecting my missions to look like. And I think many people often don't think that this is what missions looks like, but this is what my mission looked like, and I'm extremely proud of it um, because I just worked with administrative things, and honestly, until this year, I didn't realize how important those were. Um, just that it's things that I never even considered of, okay, like someone has to go find tickets or someone has to hail down the taxi to get us to our next location or we need to find a hotel. And so um, it was a really difficult summer for me and I think it really changed the way that I look at missions. But I'm really glad that I had this opportunity and honestly, I'd like to maybe have the opportunity again. But I just wanna encourage you guys and what I said already of um, God doesn't call the qualified Sometimes we've, okay, actually all the time we fall short. <laughs> we are not good enough to do it on our own. Um, but God gives us the strength to do it. And even in our weakness, he is able to do something much greater than we are able to do. And so just in everyday life, um, whether it's here at Calvary or out in the streets, like whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, fire up and you're like, man, I don't know how to do a Bible story. Well, Maybe you can just like play games with them or something. Like just use your talents because I'm an introvert and I'm not much of a talker. Like I can barely walk up to a person I don't know and be like, hey, I'm Hannah. Let alone be like, hey, you want to hear about Jesus? <laughs> um, but in my introvertedness, like God can use me for something like this. He can use me to help the team operate. And, um, and I, I think that's where God like, I think that's where I, I really do work well is um, in this. And I think this is one of the trips that, while I do struggle with what I did, um, it's one of the trips that I feel most um, fit me the best. I think it fit me really well, and I'm really glad for the opportunity I had. And I just want to thank you guys for supporting me, um, because without you guys and without my other supporters, like, this summer wouldn't have happened. And I believe that God is continuing to do special things through my students that I had this summer and through the people that they interacted with. And so I just want to say thank you. And I want to say that um, although I was the one that physically went to Turkey, you guys all went with me. So thank you.